Good evening, everybody, and welcome. Thank you for joining us here today. My name is Kim Daniels, and I'm the Associate Director of the Initiative on Catholic Social Thought and Public Life here at Georgetown University. I'm over here. Uh, <laughs> this has been a really devastating year for the Catholic Church here in the US and globally. Uh, as the clergy sexual abuse crisis has broken into the open once again with grave crimes committed against children and other vulnerable people and serious failures of leadership on the part of our bishops and others who covered up problems rather than facing them straight on. I said that this year has been devastating, but the fact is this past few weeks have been devastating. It's been emblematic of the past years. We've had revelations about Cardinal DiNardo's mishandling of a case of abuse. Cardinal Pell's appeal is being heard in Australia. A blockbuster Washington Post report about Bishop Bransfield's wrongdoing in the Diocese of Wheeling, West Virginia, including revelations that the archbishop who was investigating his wrongdoing wasn't transparent regarding Bishop Bransfield's financial gifts, including gifts to himself. It left many, we had some hopeful signs this past week when the US Conference of Catholic Bishops adopted measures to move us forward, and they are real steps forward. And at the same time, many observers wondered whether our bishops get it in watching this, these, uh, con this convening. It's clear that we're living at a crucial moment in the life of the church. American bishops are facing a crisis of credibility, and American Catholics are anguished, we're angry, and we're ready to see action. And at the same time, I think that Pope Francis's words from his September 2015 speech to Congress have even more resonance today. He held up a hopeful vision, calling on us to confront every form of polarization that would divide us into two camps, and counseling that our efforts must aim at restoring hope, righting wrongs, maintaining our commitments, and thus promoting the well-being of individuals and the common good. We must move forward together as one in a renewed spirit of fraternity and solidarity, he said, cooperating generously for this common good. That is still our call as Catholics in public life. And the question is, how can we live that call in a context in which our credibility has been so severely hobbled? So tonight, we'll assess that context will assess how we can promote accountability and integrity while most effectively living out our public mission in these challenging times. And finally, we'll ask how responsible laymen and women can be salt, light, and leaven in our church and in our nation today. We've brought together a standout group of thoughtful analysts to help us think through these complicated questions, including Kathleen Domingo, Melinda Henneberger, Joan Rosenhauer, and Peter Weiner. John Carr, the director of the Initiative on Catholic Social Thought and Public Life, will moderate the discussion. Before founding the initiative, John served for over 20 years as director of the Department of Justice, Peace, and Human Development at the US Conference of Catholic Bishops. He directed the church's efforts on public policy and advocacy on major domestic and international questions. We're so glad that you can join us here in person tonight. And please join our conversation on Twitter at GUR. Our uh, Twitter handle is GUCST Public Life and use the handle Lay Leadership. Many thanks to you all and to our panelists. Let's get started. Thank you. <clears throat> uh, we ought to do a very Catholic thing. There are some people standing in the back who don't have seats. If you have an empty seat uh, next to you, raise your hand and come on forward. Uh, we were talking about, you know, let's have a discussion about religion, politics, sex abuse on a beautiful Friday night and see who, <laughs> see who comes. And uh, it, it turns out either that's a very important topic or you people need to get a life. Uh, I, I go for this a very important topic. Uh, as Kim suggested, uh, there are terrible human, spiritual, institutional costs of the clerical sexual abuse crisis. I think the most overlooked cost has been the damage done to the church's voice and impact in public life 
when our principles and our experience and our values most need to be heard uh, at a time of enormous polarization, uh, th real threats to the poor and vulnerable, the unborn and undocumented people, uh, simple questions of character, of uh, truthfulness in public life, and that candidly, uh, the institutional church, the institutional Catholic church, is not in a position to make the case that we should. And so the question is, is that true? What is the damage? What does it look like? And what can we do about it? And especially, what can lay people do about it? Uh, a number of us have been here today, will be here tomorrow, and today we focus on the internal dynamics in the church. Tomorrow we're gonna focus on the external, and tonight we're gonna make that pivot, and we have the right people to do it. Joan Rosenauer is the executive director of Jesuit Refugee Services. Uh, she worked at Catholic Relief Services and at uh, the United States Conference of Catholic Bishops. Melinda Henneberger, is a distinguished journalist, has worked for the Times, the Post, uh, now is a columnist for the uh, Kansas City Star, was just uh, identified as a finalist for the Pulitzer Prize in commentary. Uh, we're delighted to have uh, Melinda here. Kathleen Domingo is on the front lines from Los Angeles, working to put together pro-life and social justice issues, and our outsider, the, the, the sage uh, from the rest of the world is Peter Weiner, who is an evangelical leader and has written a marvelous uh, new book on why politics is important. And so we have in some ways an insider, uh, a commentator, a local leader, and an evangelical ally. And the question I want to start with is, first of all, is this an overlooked cost? What, what are the consequences of the scandal for our impact in public life? Based on your experience and observations, different, uh, how has the voice and witness of the church been damaged, and what are the consequences of that? And if you want to start talking about what we should do about that in this first answer, that'd be great. But first, is the premise of this right? that the crisis has not only had internal damage to our faith and our community, but it's hurting the larger community by undermining our voice. And so with that, let me turn to Joan first. Okay. Well, um, I think Kim captured well uh, what we're dealing with here. This has been horrible. We're known now, um, the leaders of our church certainly are known for the exact opposite of what we should be and what we believe and who we are as, as Catholic Christians. Um, and the fact is that in public life, the bishops and the clergy, and I, and I say this with real heartache because there are some wonderful bishops and there are some wonderful members of the clergy, wonderful priests and others, and some of them are in this room right now. And yet, uh, as a group, they have lost uh, credibility and they don't have the standing, I don't think, to speak out in public life and be effective persuading people about the issues that are facing us. I saw um, recently that one of the bishops, one I respect very much, I won't name him, has suggested that the next version of their document on, on faith in public life, which is called Faithful Citizenship, that the next version should include a section on character. And I thought, the idea that the bishops of the United States are gonna teach the faithful and the public about character is just, not going to work. It's just not going to work. I mean, I don't even know that I would say they shouldn't include it, but it is just such a mismatch right now. I've been at some recent um, events, especially with young Catholics, and, and the words that are used are, are clueless and tone deaf and things like that. So um, what I want to say about all this, it's really heartbreaking, but it is the reality. What I want to say about all this is that at this time, the bishops of the United States cannot be the leaders in public life on behalf of the Catholic Church. They just can't. And that means that it's up to us to be strong and bold as the laity and provide that leadership in public life and lift up our values and what we believe uh, on so many issues that John has lifted uh, up. Um, so I wanna say two things about the laity. 
since I'm suggesting we should be the real leaders in public life. One is that um, let's remember that we have not cornered the market on virtue or integrity or honesty. That in some cases, it was the laity who advised the bishops to do things that got us in this trouble to begin with, whether it's uh, that people could, or that priests could be rehabilitated and reassigned, or whether it's that uh, uh, you, know, you, you should never meet with the families or apologize or anything like that. So we have to walk the walk, and we have to hold ourselves accountable to that. Um, the other thing I want to say about the laity, and I think especially church leaders, we have to get out of our bubble. Because people like me, and I think other, some of the others in this room, maybe not everybody, we, we can get a little consumed with this crisis. We think that the crisis is the center of everything. And it, it should be at one level. But um, at last Sunday at Mass, I'm a greeter at 5 o'clock. And uh, the, uh, an older member of the parish and I were in the back. And I said, you know, what do you think about Bransfield and all this stuff? And she was like, oh, my gosh, it's so awful. It's terrible. And then we're watching the, our parish fill up at 5 o'clock Mass on Sunday with young people, millennials. And I thought to myself, you know what? I wonder how many of them would know what I'm talking about if I asked them about Michael Bransfield. You know, would that name re resonate with them? So I think we have to remember that not everybody is quite as obsessed uh, with all of this as some of us are. And as a result of that, my experience is that the people in the pews and the general public, and when I go to Capitol Hill, people on Capitol Hill know us as more than the worst actions of any of our members. So I want to focus especially on the, our social mission, and that's what I know most. And I, and, I, and I want to say that if you ask most people if the Catholic Church is on the front lines of caring for people who are struggling in our country, people who are poor, immigrants, and others, they would say absolutely the Catholic Church is on the front lines in those areas. And if you ask them, you know, I work for Jesuit Refugee Service. If you ask them, is the Catholic Church on the front lines of responding to the enormous crisis of people having to flee their homes all over the world, is the Catholic Church on the front lines of responding? People would mostly say yes. They know that we're doing that. People know, just two other examples I don't want to leave out, education. We are all over this country providing education, essential education for people. And we're also on the front lines of health care and in many other ways serving people. So I want us to remember not to get so much in our bubble, but remember that we are known for more than this crisis, which leads to my third and final po point, which is a little bit of the be not afraid. We need to lift up the outstanding ways that our church continues, our community of faith, the church is the people of God, right? How we continue every day through all of this crisis to witness God's love for the most vulnerable all over the world. We can be proud of what Catholic Charities is doing and Catholic Relief Services is doing and JRS is doing. And, and we need to keep doing it and not think that this crisis can impede us in any way. It can't stop us. We can't let it stop us. If we did, it would be another violation of who we are and what we believe. And we can't let that happen. So we have to use that ministry that we are doing among the poorest of the poor all over the world as our um, credibility as our, as our standing to maintain a powerful voice in public life as lay leaders on issues affecting the most vul vulnerable. So the bishops can't be the leaders in this. We have to step up and we have to be strong in stepping up. We need to walk the walk. We need to be proud of the witness that we provide all over the world and acknowledge that people know about that witness. And on that basis, we can speak out, we can weigh in on public issues that affect the poor and vulnerable. And we have to do it more than ever now and, and stronger than ever now. Thank you. Uh, Melinda, you and I are friends. And Joan talked about heartbreak. Uh, people know you as a columnist, your time at the Post, uh, at the New York Times. You were the Rome bureau chief for a long time. Uh, when the Pulitzer Committee nominated you as a finalist, one of the columns they nominated, they said, for examining and spare and courageous writing, institutional sexism and misogyny within her hometown NFL team, her former governor's office, and the Catholic Church. Uh, when the saddest days in that crisis for me is when I read your column. 
that said, after a lifetime, the Catholic Church has finally driven me out. Joan talked about the bishops' failures. They can't be leaders. The rest of us have to step up. In some ways, you've said, to be true to yourself, you have to step out. Uh, what led you to that? How damaging is this to not only our faith, your faith, but also to the public witness of the church? That's a lot. Mm. <laughs> so my faith hasn't changed. A, a lot of people have said to me, you know, oh, I'm sorry you lost your faith. I believe today what I believed yesterday and last year and the year before that. But being in the church is uh, being in a relationship. And so I felt that I, I love my church as much as I ever did, but I, I felt like I can't be married to you anymore. <laughs> you know, that it's too far. And people wanted me to have a theological explanation for it, and I do not have that. I just couldn't take it anymore. It was, you know, and I've been not just in the church, but also covering the church for many years. So, and when I was covering the Vatican, it was the height of the first round of this scandal in 02 and 03. And that was tough, but that was nothing compared to this, because this was, we we seem not to have learned anything. We just kept from sea to shining sea and indeed across the world, hiding the problems and putting the brand before the people. And it, it's heartbreaking to everyone, but I felt that for me, and I'm glad others don't feel this way because it's true that the world needs the church more than ever, but I just felt to stay was to be complicit was to say, you know how uh, politicians say at the end of the commercial, I approve this message? I felt that to some extent to stay was to say, maybe I don't approve this message, but I don't disapprove of it enough to leave. And so even though I've lost a lot, I mean, my identity was very much and still is. I mean, you know, I'm a Catholic person, but I couldn't... I couldn't continue on, and so I've lost the sacraments, I've lost the community. It's honestly a very sad thing, but um, I felt like I really didn't have a choice. And I see every day how when our, as you were saying, when our leaders, when our so, sometimes so-called leaders, speak out on things and they're absolutely right, on immigrants, on caring for the vulnerable, the, what's the first response is, we know who you are, we know what you did, and we are not open to listening to you. So, you know, when you say, too, that the lay leaders um, have a degree of responsibility in this, very true. Across the country, when these stories became public knowledge, Many, many parishes said, that can't be true of my nice father so-and-so. I'm sticking by him. So, you know, the laity has, has a role in, in this debacle also. But the main thing that I see, and, and I so hope for the best for the church, that, that you know, it, we can get past this, but it's, I still feel like after everything we've been through, we still haven't realized the depth of the damage done. And you might say, how could we? Of course we understand the depth. So, you know, this morning, Archbishop Gregory, who I think is a very good man, and I'm so glad he's here in this role in Washington, but he said, you know, I'm weary of this. Of course he's weary of it. He's been, we're all weary. He's been dealing with it all his, most of his professional life. And he said, I think that we can only stay mad so long. I think we're at the end of, you know, p this will burn itself out. People are finished being mad. Uh, no, no, and no. 
we're all, this is not even the end of the beginning of this thing. And it makes me honestly sad to hear that we still, if, if we're saying this is behind us, I've been hearing my whole adult life, this is behind us and it's time to move on. And I, I think we have a lot more time in the desert before that, that understanding is, is where it needs to be. And, to me, the only answer can come from humility and listening to women's voices, for heaven's sake. I see again and again, if, if these guys who made these decisions had had, I don't even mean a woman ordained celebrating mass beside them, if they had had any woman in their life in a meaningful way, she would have said, are you kidding me? <laughs> I, I know that, right? So I think that women's role in the church really has to change, and that is inextricably linked to all these other problems. So. <laughs> You said this is who you are. I neglected to say you're a graduate of Catholic U, the Catholic University in Louvain. Notre uh, Dame. Notre Dame. Oh, geez. It's okay. Where is that? Along the same line. Yeah. Well, no, no, no. That's a little school out in the country. <laughs> they play football, don't they? Uh, uh, this is, you know, this has been part of who you are, and part of the heartbreak is to lose somebody like you. Uh, Kathleen. You are on the front lines. You, you are not leaving. Uh, you are uh, fighting in a tough environment. You help put together uh, Catholic uh, pro-life work and Catholic social justice work. Uh, you lead the, uh, the office on uh, life, justice, and peace. Uh, you need to do a better job. <laughs> Some of you know I, where I got that line. Uh, but you are doing the work. Uh, uh, one of the great things that Kathleen does is something called One Life LA, which is a community oh. celebration that brings folks together across all sorts of lines to celebrate all human life. Uh, but uh, you have the degrees from the University of Chicago, uh, John Paul II Institute. But what I'm interested in hearing is somebody who's on the front lines in California, trying to put these things together. What has the crisis done to that work? How do we make our case? And what is the role of lay people? Yeah, so it's been a rough year. Um, I do government relations for the Archdiocese of Los Angeles. So um, I work with legislators in California who you can imagine are not always our friends to begin with. Um, Last summer when these stories began to break and when all the, the media came out, I think like many of you, um, you know, I work for the archdiocese and I love my job, but I'm also a mom. And when these stories started to come out, uh, I think we were all just, we felt kicked in the stomach, didn't we? Um, but as the bishop statements also started to come out, I realized that something had kind of gone awry a little bit. Um, we heard the word credibility in almost every one of the bishop's statements, but we very, very seldom heard the word children. And I think that that was, did something to me. Um, some bishops were standouts. I don't mean everyone, of course, but it was, it was fewer and far, further between than I had hoped it would be. And I think that really did something inside of me, and I think a lot of my peers, a lot of other lay people who work for the church, for whom this is our life's work, um, we felt like there was more attention paid to the institution than to its members, than to each one of us as individual Catholics, as individuals and people and families in the pews. And so I think that we have to really own that a little bit. Um, and, and I think that also colors the way that we work in the world, doesn't it? It colors the way that I approach legislators. It co colors the way I approach um, people in the community. We want to be community partners. They know this too. They're looking for something from us also that I think we haven't given them. And I don't know that we have to, but it's important for us to know that people are looking for something more, I think, from us. And so when we talk about credibility, I think that there is some truth to say that the bishops as a body, maybe not as individuals, but as a body have lost a sense of moral credibility. And that really is difficult. We have a big job to do in the world. We have a lot that we need to say. We have a lot of work ahead of us before this next general election. 
And we have to decide how are we going to do that effectively. And so I think it's important to realize, though, that the credibility of individual Catholics, of me, of you, of all of us here, of your families, of the people sitting next to you in the pews, I don't think that credibility has been lost. And I think it's very important to remember that. So if the bishops sort of lost their moral credibility, that's OK, because I think we have a certain street cred. And, and I think it's for the reasons that have already been said. Um, you all are the people who are feeding the homeless in your neighborhoods. You're adopting and fostering children that are in need of homes. You're working on issues of immigration. You're praying outside of abortion clinics. You guys have the street cred of being Catholic. And that's very important. We don't ever want to overlook that, and we don't want to lose that. And so when I go and speak to legislators, I bring my friends. And we come with documentation of all of the good works that we're doing. And we walk in the room, and I, I say, I'm here to represent the Archdi Archdiocese of Los Angeles and Archbishop Gomez, but these folks are just Catholics. And they want to talk to you about issues that are important to them as Catholics and as Catholic parents. And I think that's really important. So I want to encourage you to keep doing that. And I think that that's really where our strength is. Um, another thing that I have noticed is that we don't have a lot of friends. <laughs> and um, we need to be each other's friends, right? There's a lot of fighting that goes on in parishes. There's a lot of polarization. We had a whole talk about that about a year ago. There's a whole lot of polarization in our parishes. There's the right Catholics and the left Catholics and the pro-life Catholics and the immigration Catholics. And you notice those are the two biggest issues that are really facing us as Catholics in the upcoming election season. And yet there's fighting and fighting inside the parishes. There might even be fighting inside your own homes, inside your own families over these issues. But I encourage you to really keep in mind that we're Catholic first. And that is the most important thing. That is our identity. Because I'll tell you, out in the world, when you go and talk to other people, they are not our friends. <laughs> we have to be each other's friends. And I can be friends with you if you're on the left or you if you're on the right if you're Catholic first. And if that's what we bring first to the table, is to say, your issue doesn't have to be my issue. It doesn't have to be my heart's passion but I recognize the great work that you're doing, and I recognize that you love Jesus and I love Jesus, and that makes us strong together and united. And so I would encourage you to really try intentionally to overcome that internal polarization in our parishes and in our church, because that is also our strength. And the last thing I would say is, if our bishops are not the spokespersons for our Catholic moral teaching, we have to be, and that means we have to know what it is. So I encourage all of you, this is the time to double down on your faith. This is the time to really search your heart and see if you need, I think we all need, to undergo a bit of a deeper conversion. And I encourage you, now is the time. Because we are going to be called upon in a way, people are going to look to us to say, where does that moral authority reside? It can't have vanished. No, no, it's just transferred a little bit maybe right now, right? I think it's transferred to us. And so we have to really know what we're talking about. We have to believe it in our gut. We have to be willing to stand up for it. And so I would encourage you, if you look and you say, this is what we don't want, right? We don't want this clericalism. We don't want sexual abuse. We then need to be the exact opposite of that. So what does that look like? I think that means we need to embody things like kindness, humility, chastity, right? I think it also means that we need to be models of what does it mean to be Catholic and who we are. If you're married, exemplify a beautiful holy marriage, right? Show that we still believe in our sacraments. We still believe in the faith that's been handed to us in our moral teaching. So I would encourage you to really rejoice in your faith at this moment um, and recognize that we are now called to be the voice for our faith. And you can do it. <clears throat> Peter, Kathleen uh, said we don't have a lot of friends. <laughs> uh, you're one of our friends. Uh, <laughs> oh, thank you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Some people would say you need to be careful about who you choose <laughs> as your friends. I mean, you have done so much in your life. You're at the Ethics and Public Policy Center now. Uh, you write a column uh, for the New York Times. You're a contributing editor to Atlantic. Uh, you worked in several Republican campaigns. You worked in the Reagan White House. You were a speechwriter for George W. Bush. Uh, you've written books, City of Man, Religion and Politics in a New Era with our friend Michael Gerson, Wealth and Justice, The Morality of Democratic Capitalism, 
with Arthur Brooks, who has been a part of our, our work at the initiative. And then you have a new book with the very modest uh, title, not at all topical, The Death of Politics. <laughs> That's upbeat. Uh, <clears throat> How to Heal Our Frayed Republic After Trump. Uh, Melinda talked eloquently and sadly uh, that she no longer can be a part of this institution. You wrote a column that I remember to this day saying, why I can no longer call myself an evangelical Republican. You might want to say something about that. There are some lessons for us on that. But I would like to ask you, can, can you still say you're a friend of the Catholic Church in its defense? of human life and dignity, and what does this crisis in our church mean for the chaos in our nation? Sure, thank you. Thanks for, for having an outsider uh, on, the, uh, on the panel uh, and to be up here. I'm, I'm honored to be here and moved, quite frankly, to, uh, to be here with, with these folks. I, uh, I still consider myself a friend of the Catholic Church and certainly consider myself friends of, of individual um, Catholics. Um, I'd say a couple of things. One thing that struck me in listening to these uh, comments, you know, there's that line in, in scripture that the wages of sin is death, but the wages of sin is also heartbreak uh, and tears and pain. And I think people don't often recognize that uh, until it's happened. And they, then they see the blast radius of sin and what it does um, to the lives of the people above all who are victims, but not just to them, uh, to, to the people uh, who have given their hope and their trust and their confidence uh, in institutions and in individuals. And, um, and so it's a very painful um, moment and a very painful uh, episode um, for you more than me because this is your home and this is your church, but even for me. Uh, and, and so I'm, I'm sorry for that. Um, and... Uh, in terms of, of, of the damage that it's, that it's done, I mean, I think it's enormous. Um, I, I'll just, just give an anecdote. Uh, when I wrote this book, it is the death of politics, but I, but I add that I'm a Christian, so I believe in life after death. So, <laughs> uh, so, so uh, what, what, what is dead need not remain dead, and, and most of the book is an effort to try and, and uh, get a little resurrection here. But um, I have a chapter on faith and politics um, and I'm from the evangelical world. I no longer call myself an evangelical for somewhat different reasons than, than um, Melinda, but, but, but some overlap as well. Um, but I was trying to go through and say, what, is, what can evangelicals learn from others? And the Catholic Church was one of them. So I have a section on the need to develop a coherent vision, and Catholic social thought has been so helpful to me and to other people that I know Mike is a, is a very good friend, but so many evangelicals, they've given, I think, evangelicals the language for public engagement um, and a kind of framework. Um, and, it's, and, and I'm indebted to the Catholic Church for that. And so I was in the book, I was describing the cornerstones of, of Catholic social thought, the respect for human dignity, uh, subsidiarity and solidarity with the poor. And I had to add a section on the Catholic abuse scandal because it would have been absurd for me to talk about this without saying I was you know, uh, sick to the core by what had happened here. So that's just one small anecdote about how this, how this uh, happens. This has cast a shadow over, over the church. And it's a double blow. It's a huge, huge blow to the institution itself. No one would deny that, but it's, it's a blow to our country as well. Sometimes an institution is simply an institution and that it has to, it has to uh, do repair. What's different about the Catholic Church is it has a vital role in the life of this nation. Um, and that's been uh, harmed and hurt as well. And so it's, it's, it's very hard for reasons that, that have been eloquently stated here for the Catholic Church to speak out, at least institutionally, in ways that it has before. And, and in my mind, that um, that's a, uh, a a huge loss, you know. When I think about what what has to be done, I mean, there there there's no magic wand about getting out of these things, and it doesn't. Anytime a, you have a trauma, uh, it uh, it takes it takes time, and sometimes there's this I think this impulse to let's speed this along, let's just get 
over this. And sometimes you can't do it. You have to get through it, and that takes time. Um, I guess the way I would think about it in terms of the approach is several things. It seems to me that the Catholic Church has to uh, show to the world um, that it cares more about this crisis than anybody else. Not for branding purposes, not for institutional purposes, but because there were shattered lives and that was shattered by people who are part of our institution, who we trusted. And we have to get to the bottom of it and we have to clean it up and we have to find out what went wrong. Why did this happen? How did this happen? And how can we show that it will never happen again? And it can't be words. The Catholic Church is way past that. The words, frankly, they, they sometimes are counterproductive. It's like we've been through this dance before. It, it, there has to be um, accountability and there have to be real, real steps. Um, but that really has to be a sense that, that we're doing it not as, 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 uh, you know, as a public relations challenge, but because we feel like that, the, that uh, so much damage has been done that we need to, to repair. So I think that that's one thing. You have to name it and you have to get, uh, you have to get, get through it. Um, I think what was said about having lay Catholics speak up, I think you're very, it's very true. I, I think if you can get away from the institutional association and in, to get into individual organizations and individual lives, it's a different world because so many people have seen what Catholics do, their own lives have been touched by it. So um, I, I wouldn't overreact in that sense and think that every time a person sees a, a, an individual as a Catholic faith, they think, oh my gosh, you know, there goes a supporter of, you know, sexual abuse. It's not like that at all. This is probably a more evangelical perspective than a Catholic perspective, but I don't know that you, you save individual lives institutionally as much as you do individually um, by individual acts of kindness, by individual love, by individual care. Um, we're saved an individual at a time, a conversation at a time, a hand at a time, uh, a heart at a time. And everybody in this room has the capacity to change a life. Um, everybody has a different gift. You know, as scripture talks about the church having arms and legs and ears and eyes. Uh, you don't have, nobody, we don't have to do the same thing. Uh, we all reach different people at different stages because in different seasons, but everybody can do, uh, do something. And one person acting alone uh, can't do much, but a lot of people acting together can create a culture. And that's simply what, uh, what, what I think has to, has, to, uh, has to happen. And then there may be some overlap in, uh, in what I've written about politics, which is we're thinking about maybe sometimes in dark moments that you feel as, as Catholics which is don't succumb to corrosive cynicism or despair or fatalism. Don't get stuck thinking that it's shattered and it can't be fixed and there's nothing we can do. That's, that's the worst attitude of, uh, of all. You just have to acknowledge the reality, which is that, that uh, as I said, this is something that the church is gonna have to walk through and individual Catholics are gonna walk through, but as you're walking through it, change a life, uh, which a lot of the people up here are doing. Uh, and heal a life and, and be an agent of, um, of reconciliation. Um, you know, I hope the Catholic Church is able to find its voice in public affairs. It's so needed. There's so much uh, that, that the Catholic Church has to offer for this moment in the life of a nation on, on issues, uh, for sure. But I think even more generally in terms of tone and attitude, and, uh, and disposition and, uh, and temperament. Um, and I, you can still do that, but, but the church can't do it until people are convinced that this issue is taken, if, if not, it's not gonna take care of it, but that, uh, that there is a passion to, to correct this, this great wrong. Otherwise, people look at it and they think, you know, heal thyself. You don't have anything to tell me. You don't have anything to teach me. You guys did this, and you're trying to t tell me about immigration or life or the poor or, or dignity? Who, who are we kidding here? So that has to be there, but 
but even as you do that, uh, I, I think that, uh, that that the Catholic Church can can uh, can move forward and um, and move on, and I and I hope it does because, as I said, I I think people like you have way 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 too much to offer to uh, to to not uh, to be silenced. Thank you. <clears throat> Well, uh, we're talking about sin, uh, we're talking about heartbreak, uh, we're talking about failures, but as Joan said, uh, in another way, we're talking about that we're more than our failures, but we have to uh, face up to the harm that's been done, the hurt that is real. Uh, there's a part of me that says, oh, church is in crisis, but at least the country is doing well. Uh, uh, part of the cost is not only what has happened to our voice, it's when it happened. Uh, think about where we are. I mean, the, the sort of fundamentals of truth, civility, uh, respect for the law, concern for the vulnerable, respect for human life, uh, welcome to refugees and immigrants, uh, the humanity of unborn children and the rights and lives of women. All this has become the fodder for partisan war and ideological combat. So uh, Joan and I worked together at the Bishop's Conference, and uh, she not only runs Jesuit Refugee Service, she was Vice President of uh, Catholic Relief Services and helped us think about the Catholic social teaching that Peter talked about. Uh, when we worked together at the Bishop's Conference, we worked on faithful citizenship, on the role of the church in public life. So, one of the questions is if, if I think we're pretty clear about the mess we're in, and I think there was actually some consensus about how we move forward with lay leadership building on what we do instead of what our leaders say. How do we make a contribution in the middle of a public life that seems to threaten the poor and vulnerable and leave no room for the common good. What does faithful citizenship look like today? Not necessarily for what the bishops might say or not say, but how we act in the middle of this mess with an election upon us. You're asking me? You. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> um, well, that's an easy one. Um, <laughs> Um, I, you know, I think there are elements of what is in faithful citizenship that are still really important for us to, to remember. And, and part of that is that it really does reflect and affirm the, um, what, what is essentially the consistent ethic of life, which is so wonderful. I was at a conference the other day and somebody said, our teaching makes so much sense. And it, and it really does. And so I think as, as um, citizens and as faithful Catholics, we have to really focus on that teaching and um, contribute it to the public debate and not be afraid to do that. We, you know, that, that, that um, you know, recognizing the, the uh, value of people from conception to natural death and all that that means and all of the issues that, you know, have been listed here, that has to be lifted up. Um, we can't, one of the things that's in faithful citizenship is that we can't, align ourselves so clearly with a party or a candidate that we abandon half of what we believe. And um, that's an easy thing to do in the current culture. So I think we have to stand by that idea that nobody has us in their pockets, that we're going to hold every candidate accountable for that range of issues. And they're going to be challenged on the ones where they disagree with us. And we're going to affirm them on the ones where they agree with us. Um, and so I, I think that's an important part to continue to lift up and that we have to, to bring to life in our public life and what we bring to the public debate. Um, even though I said that the, the bishop's teaching about character is a little hard to, to get used to at this stage, 
that idea of character um, is certainly important in our public life. And, and um, we have not always, and this crisis has shown that we're not always kind and loving and caring for um, you know, treating others as we want to be t treated. The values that cross religions and cross really ethical uh, points of view, uh, we're not always consistent with that, but it doesn't mean that we shouldn't hold ourselves to it and hold others to it. And that has to be a part of our public debate. How do we all live up to that idea that we are here to serve other people, that we should treat others as we expect to be treated, and that uh, you know, kindness should, should rule and not um, harshness and, and divisiveness and things like that. So I think we have to continue to bring all of that that's in faithful citizenship. It may not be the vehicle. Bishop should, should issue it anyway. But it's not going to be the key vehicle. But I think we can all embody that, and we need to bring it to the debate. Thank you for that. Melinda, you may not uh, be a member of the Catholic Church right now, but you're still a uh, leader of the Sanity Caucus. Uh, <laughs> Melinda, in her columns and in her work through the ages, has taken on the sort of uh, rampant individualism at both ends of our political culture, that the market solves all our problems, or uh, choice is the only value that it's all about me, uh, it's all about money, it's all about power. What sh should religious people, you said you haven't changed your beliefs, how do we impact this mess that we find where our leaders in some ways appeal to the worst of us, divide us up into little chunks, uh, throw out things they believe for a long time, change in a minute. There's no collusion, but now collusion's OK. Uh, Hyde Amendment was good policy. Now it's not. Uh, how do religious people, people who share our values, make a contribution to the common good in the middle of this incredibly divisive uh, public square? Well, I agree with everything Joan said. I think that you mentioned kindness. That seems like such a simple thing and such a, 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 a basic, but it's a big deal when it's in such short supply, right? So I think that actually a little kindness goes further right now than it maybe ever has in my life because um, it's, it's not popular at all. You know, like it, it's, on social media and in real life, we think that to be strong is to demonize other people, to not listen to anyone who disagrees with us, to be completely unpleasant and othering and intolerant of people who aren't our people. And as you say, since we can never be perfectly aligned with either party or most candidates, you know, every they're all our people, right? So I, I really think that show, showing with your actions true tolerance and true kindness to people who deserve it or don't deserve it, and, and we all are in that bucket of not deserving it at certain times, um, means a lot and goes a long way. At the same time, I think this is such a scary moment for our country. I mean, I really worry for democracy in a way I never have, that we have to be kind and fierce. And even though we can't be aligned all the way with any party, I really do feel like we have to fight this moment um, and, and try to elect a different president. And I hope that honestly, I mean, and I am not a partisan person. But I really feel so strongly that so much is at stake now. It breaks my heart when I see Catholics saying, well, Joe Biden isn't for the Hyde Amendment anymore, so I guess there's no Democrat I can vote for. When you see everything else going down the tubes, I hope that we won't let that one, very important, but that one issue overwhelm every, every other concern about care for human life on the planet. So, A couple of housekeeping things. There are some people stuck in the back, in the way back. Let's do that thing. If you have an empty chair next to you, raise your hand. And the folks in the back, I see you, Susan. I see you, Al. <laughs> Come on up and get a seat. You can even hear what these wonderful people are saying. So. Come on, raise your hand. 
And while you're doing that, uh, you said how terrible social media can be. I want to invite you to join our conversation on hashtag lay leadership <laughs> and bring some light uh, to social media. Keep your hand up for those who um, still need a spot. A little kindness, uh, somebody said. <laughs> so, a couple more. Kathleen, you talked about being a mom, being a Catholic, being an official of the Archdiocese of Los Angeles. Uh, it's a tough time to hold together pro-life and social justice stuff. This is uh, Los Angeles' incredibly diverse community. Uh, Catholics, E.J. Dion has this great line, he says, there is no Catholic vote and it's really important. <laughs> uh, and what happens is Catholics have been with the winner in 11 of the last 12 elections. But there are big divisions, and you pointed to that in the Catholic vote. A uh, majority white Catholics voted for Trump, a majority, big majority of Latino Catholics voted for uh, Secretary Clinton. In the last election, uh, Catholics swung substantially to Democrats. We're one of the last swing voters in uh, left in our country, but we're not a monolith. I'm, I'm from a mixed marriage. My mother's family Republican, my dad's Democrat. <laughs> sort of explains the confusion I live with. <laughs> uh, how do you hold fast to the teaching of the church instead of a partisan agenda in the middle of this? That's a really good question. Um, yeah, the Archdiocese of Los Angeles, first of all, we've got 5 million Catholics. Um, every Sunday we do sacraments in 43 languages. So we're all over the, we're diverse in every possible meaning of the term, right? Um, you know, we try really hard to just focus on the individual and we talk about human dignity as much as we possibly can. You mentioned One Life LA earlier. So that's our celebration of human life that we do every year. Um, we, we gather people from all over the place and we just talk about how great it is to be human, how great it is to be alive and how great it is to be in communion with each other and doing good works to help those in need. I really think that that's the core of it. Um, and, and I want to segue just a minute, if you don't mind, uh, to, to, sit, to bring up one other thing that we're facing in California. Um, so we are working on those issues, and those can be very disparate and sometimes pull us apart. Right now, actually, the church in California has um, an interesting opportunity to come together. We right now have a bill facing us, it's SB 360, um, that seeks to uh, actually remove the seal of confession in certain instances. <laughs> And this comes directly from the abuse crisis and from what our legislators saw um, and kind of that, that drip drip in the media that we see that never lets up, right? And our legislators are just fed up with it. And so they decided that um, in their wisdom, they decided Catholics must be um, hiding uh, sex abusing priests and other people in the sacrament of confessions. We're gonna go after them. And, um, and we said, well, hold on. It, was, it came under ostensibly um, strengthening reporting requirements for, for child abuse. Um, we've done some, some background work and, and we've gotten some amendments. But So now they're just saying, well, no, we're just going to remove this, the seal of the sacrament of confession for priests and for lay people who work in the same area with priests. So what does that mean? That means they're talking, they think we're in collusion. They think that we're, we have a big cover-up going on, right? The parish secretaries are hiding with the priests doing all these things. What we've learned from that is that, um, and this isn't just a fringe group that believes this. I mean, keep in mind, the Senate of the state of California voted 30 to four in favor of this bill. So it's already passed one house. Um, you know, we're trying our best to stop it. We hope we stop it because if we don't, it's probably coming for you all. Um, but what we've learned from this though, is that this is a moment we can come together and we're actually using it as like a unifying way of saying we're Catholics first. So again, that, that idea, we're, we're seeing people, um, the Knights of Columbus are getting very involved, but also our Latino communities are getting very involved. We're mobilizing our immigration task force. They're all working on this together because this is really at the heart of who we are as Catholics and as individuals and our human dignity, but also our human rights. 
And so it's almost kind of a blessing in disguise, if you will. I don't know if I can say that because it's horrible, but at the same time, it's really an opportunity for us to come together and, and talk about who we are fundamentally and say we are Catholics and we're in this together. And so um, please pray that we win on this. Um, it really is an attack and it's something that I've learned that's different than anything I've ever seen before. Um, we know that sort of the culture has this attack on people of faith, right? They're becoming increasingly hostile to people of faith. This is an attack on religion itself which is a little bit different. And so I just want to call that to your attention because again, I, it seems to be sort of a trend in that direction that religion is now a hindrance. It's, a, it's something that is so intolerant, we can't even allow it to be itself any longer. Um, no. But it's, be, it's, become, it's become this unifying um, opportunity for us. And so- I mean, clearly <laughs> that's appalling, but the reality is what we talked about earlier is what has given people this opening. Yeah. And the, yeah, we will exactly. come together, but we need to come together to deal with the problem before we can, while we make the case. Let me go back to uh, Peter on, uh, your book is really eloquent on uh, uh, the place of politics and the role of faith in politics. You've gone through your own desert. I mean, uh, you've been a senior Republican official, you've worked in campaigns, You've been a leading evangelical. You wrote a column that sounded a lot like Melinda's column. I can't be an evangelical Republican anymore. Uh, tell us the story of your book, how you came to that, and where, how you define yourself now. Yeah, uh, sure. Ha happy to uh, to do it. Um, it's a great book. It's available on Amazon. I understand. <laughs> Bless your heart. Uh, <laughs> this is how we get crowns in heaven. Um, at least time off purgatory. Yeah, yeah exactly, exactly. You don't know what that it's, is, but it's is, really important. <laughs> this is going to get into a very intense theological debate. Yeah. I thought we agreed to avoid that. Um, yeah, it's uh, people of my view uh, now can fit in a phone booth, uh, and, uh, and 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 not a very big one. Um, yeah, it's interesting. I, I, I wrote a piece. It's it's. Um, uh, the, well, maybe I'll give a little bit of background. So my, my history is I've been a life, had been a lifelong Republican. First vote was for Ronald Reagan in 1980. Worked in three Republican administrations, uh, Reagan, George H.W. Bush, George W. Bush, uh, where I was deputy director of speech writing, and then for five years headed up a, something called the Office of Strategic Initiatives. And um, so that was uh, my- Just so people understand that, HIV AIDS program, uh, some of the best things that came out of the Bush White House came out of the Office of Strategic Initiatives. Oh, thanks. Um, and uh, and our Mike, our friend Mike Gerson, and it was was huge there. And and um, so uh, the, I mean that was my my political home, uh, and the Evangelical Church was my um, Christian home. Um, but for reasons that I, what Melinda wrote had some echoes, uh, some with, with, with me, I felt like I couldn't any longer stay in, in uh, the institution of the Republican Party um, because of who leads it and what I think is uh, the corruption that's gone on for those who, who, um, who know better uh, or should know better. And it's probably a combination of um, of both, uh, it's an interesting thing. I, I mean, I got, as you can imagine, having given my my history, I got a lot of incoming queries uh, from friends and 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 former colleagues, you know, about my view. And I, what I found myself saying is, if you took the, say, the 20 people who, over the course of my life, 20, 25 people who knew me best, um, the people when I was young, people in my Bible study the people that, my wife, the children, I would say probably 23 out of 25 wouldn't have been surprised at my position with Donald Trump. I just consider him to be an anathema to practically everything that I stand for. Um, and, uh, and the idea that the Republican Party would, would, would be his sword and his shield and defend him at, at all costs, it's just indefensible to me. And I think rather than saying I'm a Republican, but all the time, it was just simpler to say, I no longer consider myself a Republican. Uh, and I'll, I'll, let me just give two specific examples 
I don't want to make this too partisan, but, but you raise the issue of Trump, and it, it's, it's a big issue. There are two reasons that uh, I uh, f feel in particular that, that I can't support him, because his agenda, I'm a conservative, so if you said, well, whose agenda do you support more? I would say his more than Hillary Clinton's, even though I, I certainly have some, some uh, differences with him on what he's done. Um, the first is that I, uh, uh, well, there's several. One is I think that he's uh, psychologically and emotionally a dangerous man to be president. Um, and having been served in the White House, um, I think I, at least I've told myself that I have some understanding of the power of that office. And the older I've gotten, even pre-Trump, the more I have said character disposition, temperament, and judgment matters. Less where you check the box on policy issues, though that matters a lot. I spent my entire life in policy, but more in this other realm. And so I think there. Second is that he's engaged in not just, I would say, an assault on truth, but an effort to annihilate truth, to annihilate concepts of truth and falsity. Um, that is, he takes on demonstrable truths, things that we know to be true, things that you can show to be true, and says they're not true. And that's just very dangerous territory to be in. And if you don't believe me, read Vaclav Havel, the great Czech dissident who later became president, The Power of the Powerless. And so he talked about in that, in that essay about the green grocers and how you begin to live within the lie. And he said, you can't live within the lie. You have to live within the truth. And you have to revolt against manipulation. And um, so th that is second. And the, the third area, and this is again where I think the Catholic Church in some ways has so much to offer, maybe in, in some respects more than at any point in my lifetime, that is that uh, the dehumanization, the cruelty, the crudity that now characterizes uh, politics. Um, and, um, and I think that the Catholic Church has so much to offer. And to underscore what Joan said, one of the reasons that I broke from the evangelical movement, that I don't call myself an evangelical any, anymore, um, is the reason that I think the Catholic Church has done so well, which is when you said, we're Catholics first. And what I saw with the evangelical, frankly, white evangelical movement is um, that they uh, subordinated their faith to these partisan, the partisanship, and they became um, pawns in a political game, and their, their primary affiliation, as best I could tell, a lot of them, not all, I have a lot of friends who are evangelicals, it's a big movement, and, and people have varying degrees on this, but much more than I, than I had thought, they identified themselves first and foremost with, with, now with, with, with Trump, and there was this disfigurement of faith that happened. I mean, I've, and I struggle with this too, I think we all do, confirmation bias is very real, but I at least always thought that what you would try and do is imperfectly as a, per, as a follower of Jesus is you'd say, all right, what, as best as I can tell, what's the teaching of Jesus and the, and, and, and the scriptures? And how do you, again, imperfectly conform your life in, in various aspects to it, including your political life? And I think what's happened to a large part of the evangelical movement is the opposite. They've said, what is my, what, the starting point here is the partisanship and how do I conform my faith to make it, to make it, um, to make it fit. Um, now, maybe there's a lesson in this too. When I say I'm not an evangelical, I tell people, but I'm still a Christian. And when I say I'm not a Republican, I say I'm still a conservative. So it's not just the institutional home. You, you don't have to jettison everything you believed um, because you're no longer comfortable in the home. And sometimes you leave the home because you feel like that they've in fact jettisoned everything that you, that you, um, that you once, uh, once believed. Um, let me say a couple of things on this political moment, too, because uh, I think it is a difficult moment. Um, the first thing is always to keep perspective. So this country has been through a lot worse than we have now. It's certainly the case that there are some things that are sui generis to this time, and we've never had a president quite like Trump. But, uh, you know, you go back to the election of 1800, Jefferson and Adams. That was a brutal affair. It almost tore apart the young republic. We had the Civil War. 700,000 people died in a country of 30 million. That's the equivalent of 7 million today. The late 1960s and early 1970s, riots in the street, uh, the, the racial tension, the Vietnam War, March on the Pentagon, Kent State, Watergate, uh, 
the Chicago Convention in 1968, you know, blood in the streets, the assassination of King, the assassination of, of Bobby Kennedy. Uh, there were, in an 18 month period between 71 and 72, there, there were five domestic bombings uh, a day uh, in, the, in the United States. So th there have been difficult times. And the other thing is, just to echo one other thing, and I'll, I'll end on this note, is you can't give up hope. If you haven't read it before, a lot of you probably have, uh, look up Bobby Kennedy's uh, University of Cape uh, Town speech in South Africa in 1966. I'm a huge fan of Bobby Kennedy's speeches. I think that's my favorite one. And he warned against the danger of futility, particularly for young people. The, uh, and then he went on to say that every time a man stands up for an ideal or acts to improve the lot of others or strikes out against injustice, he sends forth a tiny ripple of hope and that those ripples of hope together create currents. And those currents can uh, take down the largest walls of oppression. And this country is in South Africa in 1966. We don't have an apartheid regime, but they did get rid of it. And so people can't, uh, can't get into the mindset that there's nothing we can do. Uh, we, we can do it and we have to do it because politics matters, because politics for everything else you associate with it is finally and fundamentally about justice, human dignity, human flourishing. There, and if you get politics wrong, uh, there can be met, so much of what you love and care for can be swept away. And if you get politics right, it creates the conditions for human flourishing and, and human dignity. Uh, with that, why don't we uh, turn to your questions? I would just make one point. It's not only uh, evangelicals or Republicans that have their faith shape their politics. Uh, I, the other way around, have their politics shape their faith instead of the other way around. We got lots of people in our community who vote their party, their uh, class, their prejudices before they vote their principles, and it goes both ways. Uh, time for questions. Join us on lay leadership. Here's a question over here and then over there. So, uh. You gave up being Catholic. You gave up being evangelical. With the election of Trump, I gave up being white. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, so, I'm sorry. I don't qualify to be black or Asian, or, but I'm not that anymore. But, but the thing of it is this, is that um, this, what we are, have experienced over the last 15 or so years is the tip of the iceberg in our social problem. This week, the Southern Baptists are dealing with this issue in Texas. The evangelical community is dealing with this. They might not be as centralized, but the problem is as deep. And, and we have to see this as a possibility and, a, and an opportunity to be a leader in how to open up the church and how to solve this problem with all the people involved, not by a hierarchy, but by spreading the table out and making it equal so that, that the lay people have, we'll still let the bishops sit in, okay? They, and they can participate and they can have an equal vote, but they are not higher than me. And they are not, and they are not going to determine whether I go to heaven or not. That's between me and God. But I have to disagree with you on one point, ma'am, and that is, is I am not a Catholic first. I'm a mother first. I'm a human being first. I'm a whole lot of things before I'm just a Catholic. Okay, uh, we got a couple over here. Why don't we do them um, uh, together? And uh, two there and one there, and then we'll give the panel a chance. Uh, I'd like to invite uh, Joan to think about the, the theology of stark naked compromise on the big ones. It's about two years, I think, since Tom Reese wrote it, that it's time for a Mrs. Murphy's boarding house deal on abortion. He linked it to the 68 uh, Fair Housing Act. I, in fact, recall vividly it was the 64 Civil Rights Act, Title II. I was here, and Dick McSorley would periodically round up a posse of us to go up and wave signs and raise hell. And it, 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 nobody wasted time going through the motions of saying there is a, a, a philosophical, a theological, and epistemological basis for saying below, you know, 10 and fewer 
you can get away with keeping out the coloreds, but 10 and more, and you're in interstate, you know, nobody bothered pretending there had to be an intellectually coherent. It was a deal, a stark naked deal. Now, how do we get through abortion other than by a stark naked deal? So many weeks, bingo. Okay. Uh, I'm going to repeat my uh, uh, warning I use all the time. Please put your question in the form of a question. <laughs> That's not a comment on what we've had. It's a warning to the people in the future. And then I'm going to ask the panel to uh, respond. I'll be very brief, I promise. And my question will be, Sorry. does the panel agree with me that uh, one, one way for us as laity to play a stronger role than we have on an issue that's personally important to me is to show kindness and tolerance where the Catholic Church has not always done that to the members of the LGBT community. And I, I thank, you, thank you very much. Uh, Melinda and others know that there, at, at places like St. Francis Xavier in the village in New York, there's been wonderful historic work done by the lady at a time when, when uh, uh, victims of AIDS were not permitted a mass of Christian burial at a Catholic church in New York. The lady at St. Francis Xavier formed a ministry in the early 80s. I'm just asking if, if we could all, uh, as Catholics, sp as laity, speak out in, in support of them. Great. One more back here, and then I'm going to turn to the panel. Vince? Hi, uh, I'm, my name is Vince Wolfen, and I'm chairman of the Philadelphia chapter of John Carr Fan Club. <laughs> <laughs> John, John, so what? It's I'm, a I'm, small I'm, group, Vince. <laughs> <laughs> so what, what, what I'm going to do is uh, make a statement and hopefully be a little bit pr provocative, and my question will be whether or not your panel would agree or disagree. First of, first of all, I think it's very impressive that all the members of the channel are so open in sharing uh, their considerable talent of information that they have and where they're coming from it. What I want to do is tell you what I think I heard and what the impact of what I heard has on me in standing up and asking my question. It was interesting. I've heard what I think is a lot of hand-wringing about the problem and the issue. I've heard about a woman who has the voice of despair. I've heard about a cheerleader who says, hey, there's a Catholic way of doing things and we ought to let people know where we're doing that. And I've heard about an evangelical who said, you know, we believe in the power of one, but we really ought to believe in the power, power of the group. And my reaction is, the impact it has on me is I think we're really misdiagnosing the root of the, of, of, of the institutional problem. And I think that the problem is that we have lost touch with the importance of remembering the value proposition of the church, which is the same value proposition in which our country was built, and that is built on the idea of humanistic values. And it seems to me that the hierarchy of the church has lost its credibility to be able to lead us in this conversation humanistic values. But underneath the hierarchy, there's a tremendous group of talented uh, of clerics who I think if we could encourage the working together of the laity with these clerics, where we not only encourage them to speak to humanistic values and what the church is doing with respect to living up to it, but also train them to speak articulately, number one, and to be continually well-informed. Uh, I think uh, one of the panelists made mention that there are a number of people who wouldn't do it. So, so what, I'm, what, what I would suggest is that uh, we try and forge some way that you get the church to agree that the laity ought to be working with the, with the clerics but underneath the hierarchy. And what they ought to be doing is focusing on humanistic values and teaching the clerics how to articulate about it smartly, number one, and continue to be informed sure. about it, number two. Thanks, Phil. Uh, I, may, this may, I may lose my membership in the fan club. No wringing of hands here. I mean, we are, 60 of us are spending two days trying to do what Vince is talking about, but you've got quite a menu here. Uh, is there a deal to be done on abortion? I actually think there used to be one called safe, legal, and rare. It's the law of the land, and no one has to pay for someone else's abortion, but that's just me. Uh, kindness towards LBGTQ people. I think we're making some progress there. And couldn't we find a way to get lay leaders and clerics 
to work to spread the gospel, I think is what Vince is saying. Uh, so who wants to take what? I'll, I'm happy to, uh, to start and let other people formulate their ideas. Um, I'll just pick up th threads um, that, uh, of, of some of what was said. Um, there is a, um, uh, an artist out at uh, Fuller Seminary, uh, Maku Fujimura, and um, he has a lovely phrase. Uh, it's called, he says that we have to think in terms of culture care, not culture war. Um, and it's a very different way of, uh, of understanding one's role uh, as a faithful Christian in the culture. And um, he and Mark Laberton is president of Fuller. And Mark, in a, uh, who's a close friend of, of Maku's, tells a story of an evangelical church that, that years ago was, had orthodox views on human sexuality. And they didn't change those views. But they went out of their way to tend an AIDS uh, garden in San Francisco, uh, which is a place that, that people would congregate uh, who had lost uh, friends uh, and family members from AIDS. And they began to tend. Nobody asked them to do it. They began to tend to it. And as this was going on, the, the people there uh, really appreciated it and ended up asking them at, at, at a uh, uh, annual celebration, annual gathering that they had if they would take care of it. And what happened is that there were these relationships formed, relationships of trust, relationships of understanding, relationships of understanding people's different life experiences. Um, I don't know that they changed any minds uh, as it related to their views on, on, on human sexuality, um, but lives were changed. And that was an example of how Christians can, I think, begin to transform culture in a very, very different way. One way I've heard it referred to is the difference between thinking that uh, the model being this is the promised land versus being a faithful exile. If you think this is the promised land, this is our land, and, and, it's, and it's ours, it, sh it was ours to begin with, it's always ours, and we're going to fight to win it, and we're going to destroy the people who have it. That's one way to go about it. If you feel like you're a faithful exile, that's a very different mindset. There you lean into your enemies, uh, and there you, 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 you try and become an agent of healing and, and reconciliation. Two other quick points. Um, on the kindness and, 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 and uh, tolerance, um, I think that that, I think the, the view, the, the, the mood of the country by and large today is exhausted and to some extent embarrassed and they're looking for something else. I, I have a theory, which is sometimes viruses create their own antibodies. <laughs> and, um, and sometimes in the life of an individual or an institution, there are certain qualities that you take for granted that uh, when they're stripped from you, uh, you uh, suddenly dawns on you why you cherish them to begin with, and then you begin to, to fight for them. And I think that that is going to be happening in our country in all sorts of ways, that things like decency, integrity, civility, um, maybe we, we forgot why they mattered. Um, but I think we're being reminded uh, on a daily basis. And as to the first question, um, the Me Too movement, I think this is one of the best uh, movements of the last 100 years. Um, it's a very painful movement in the same way that the Catholic Church has it. But this we're not talking about new uh, issues that have come up. What's happened is that there was this, these awful acts of abuse that were going on in the shadows that a lot of people didn't know about or didn't want to know about. And there was this implicit deal going on, which is uh, it's going to happen, and we're not going to go public. And if anybody goes public, we're going to destroy the people who do it. And in the blink of an eye, it seems like this thing has changed. Um, and that is important because it was the right thing to do. And it's important because it shows you that a culture can change sometimes a lot faster than you think. Can I just a couple, if there are any hands over here, we did a bunch over here. So if uh, particularly we've had a bunch of guys, if there are any women who have a question, uh, I would encourage that. Uh, here's, I'm sorry to put you on the spot, but please. Thank you. Um, when I lived in Boston, I lived across the street from John Gagan. Um, oh. Yeah, I know. And, uh, 
tell everybody who might not know who uh, John So John Gagan, Gagan uh, was sort of ground zero of the sex abuse crisis. He's the, the priest that was convicted of, I think, 150. Um, and then he was beat to death in prison. Um, and I always thought that Cardinal Law should have turned in his uh, red hat for an orange jumpsuit, but uh, that didn't happen. Um, but my question, and so I, and I teach um, uh, the theology and ethics in uh, high school, and so I always had the experience of the loss of credibility of the church uh, when you're trying to talk about ethics and social justice and you have this elephant in the room. Um, but yesterday I was actually really concerned about um, reading that there were several bishops who would not sign on to the um, to the Pope's stance on the death penalty. Um, and so I was just wondering what the panel thought of that in terms of just this further erosion of credibility, the partisanship that's um, now public um, within the hierarchy itself, um, sure. you know, how that seems to be eroding as well. Since Peter and uh, Melinda uh, uh, responded to the last questions, I'm going to ask Joan and Kathleen to respond to this and make any final comments you want to offer. Um, sure. Uh, well, I, I, yeah, I think that um, uh, open division like that in the church is never good. And um, the, the you know evolution of the teaching on the death penalty has been clear for a while. So it's not like this was a dramatic move or something. So I don't know what to say about that. It, it, it surprises me. Um, and, and I think the Holy Father has really just um, looked at the signs of the times and the reality of the death penalty and where, it, it, if it's ever needed now, and said, no, it isn't, and therefore we should never accept it. So, I, yeah, I, I agree that this, this only does harm to, to, um, to credibility. Um, I, I, I guess I, my, my final comment, I want to I um, just say one other thing kind of going back, because I've been thinking about it since you raised your question about LGBTQ people, and I, uh, one of the great things about working for the Jesuits is I've gotten to know amazing Jesuits all over the world and in this country, and one of them is Jim Martin. And um, the thing some of you may be aware, of, but immediately after the, the statement from the the um, uh, education uh, dicastery, I guess, um, in, in Rome came out, he immediately sent out a tweet that said, to all LGBTQ people, God loves you. And that's the bottom line. I mean, that is the bottom line. Everything else we have to say, it has to be grounded and focused on that. And I think that is kind of a beautiful message on that question. Kathleen? Great. So. Um, I just want to thank all of you for your attentiveness this evening and for your thoughtful questions. Um, I, I know we've talked a lot about some difficult subjects. I think if I have to leave you with a comment, it would be this. We're facing a really important moment in our country. We're in a, an important moment. We're facing an even more important moment for the country and for the church. And don't let this be a missed opportunity. I think sometimes it's really easy to say, well, the bishops didn't say this or the priests didn't say this, but this is our opportunity, I think. And so I would just really encourage you, um, take this moment seriously and see what we can do. There's real hope and there's really um, an amazing current of um, especially young adults who are Catholic, who are faithful, who really want to do some amazing things. And try to tap into those people if you haven't met them, if you don't know them. They're so energetic and they're in love with the church and they want to do things. And they don't have a lot of the hangups that some of us have. They don't have a lot of the polarization um, uh, sort of baggage that some of us have. And I think that's really important to see their vitality, their energy, and then join with them to do something really good. Uh we have had a lively discussion. We have to bring it to a close. Uh, the good news is there is a reception, and I will meet you at the ice cream bar. Uh, <laughs> the, uh, the, uh, I want to thank very much our panelists. I want to thank Anna and Kim, who helped make this possible. I want to say we've had a great year, academic year, at the initiative, and we plan another one. Just previews of coming attractions on uh, September 5th, 19th, speaking of the death penalty, we'll have Sister Helen Prejean on her new book. 
I worked for the Bishop's Conference when a motion on the death penalty to oppose the death penalty passed by one vote. Uh, this week, it was 210 to 8 to oppose the death penalty. I would say that's a sign of hope. Uh, we're going to focus on Pope Francis and his leadership, and we're going to invite our new archbishop and who can talk about what he cares about, what he's trying to accomplish, and how he talks about the sex abuse, con but also racial justice. We're going to do a lot about the campaign. What does faithful citizenship? It's amazing. Everybody's talking about religion and faith, and we have a lot to say about that. So we'll see you in the fall. Uh, so there's a lot to come. I want to close with uh, a personal thought. We always say we've, we, we set up the initiative to focus on the intersection of faith and public life. And we don't deal with internal church issues. And over the last year, we have done seven gatherings about this crisis because we couldn't get to the other issues without dealing with this. Uh, as some of you know, in that process, I disclosed that I'm a survivor of sexual abuse. And I hadn't told my parents, I hadn't told my wife, uh, my kids, but I am not just a survivor, I am a believer, as you are. And I believe that our church, the gospel, Catholic social teaching, has what our society needs. And while we're heartbroken, sometimes we're on a journey out. I hope there might be a way back in. Sometimes we have to leave our spiritual home. But all of us need to stand up at a time when our country is in peril, when our church is at risk. It takes all of us. And we have faith, we have ideas, we have experience, and we have each other. And I want to thank you for coming out tonight and demonstrating that. Mm -hmm.